the Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. This is the Financial Survival Network. Financial Survival Network is presented to you by Regal Assets. Buy and sell physical gold and silver through your existing retirement plan, 100% tax-free with Regal Assets. If you want to include physical gold or silver in your existing IRA or old 401k, request your free investment kit, which was recently featured in the Forbes and Smart Money Wall Street Journal magazines. Call toll-free 855-678-6620, 855-678-6620, or visit regalassets.com. We're on with Peter Grandich, and he has great news. His nonstop stream of hate mail has stopped. I wonder if it has anything to do with gold breaking 1600 and silver breaking 31. What do you think, Peter? Well, I, I, I hate to call it hate mail. I call it nonsense mail. You know, we uh, it comes with the territory. But as you know, when gold was teetering at key support levels, and I remain so adamantly bullish. There were people who wrote, you know, emails that uh, you wonder what they do the rest of their day during their lives. But uh, it certainly has changed the makeup in the last several days. And the breaking above key resistance above 1650 and silver above $30 has certainly changed the tone in the market. And I was telling you before we began, uh, this is a classic secular bull market that had an intermediate correction that began last September from the highs. It ran almost a year. It washed out every possible <laughs> uh, enthusiasm and just about all the bulls that there might have been and allowed the bears to beat their bloody chest again. And then uh, here we go, resuming the uptrend again. So I, I very like it all systems ago. And I, you know, like I said, I think now that we'll see a serious challenge of the old highs in the next three to six months. Oh, hey, look. You look at the market. Gold started out; it was about six, seven dollars up this morning, and it's August twenty seventh. And it started out six, seven dollars up. Then it got run down, and it was three dollars under. Now it's down forty cents. The last time I looked, but more importantly, silver broke the magical thirty one dollar resistance point, which is a semi key one. And like you said. The feeling of this market, the way it moves, is totally different than just three weeks ago where you'd have these violent upswings and then equally violent slam downs. And then it just kind of went nowhere in that 1550 to 1600 range for months. And now we've seen it break through that. And to me, I believe that our optimism, and it's not so much our optimism, but just belief that the precious metals and the mining sector are the place to be is going to be vindicated once and for all very shortly. Well, you know, one of the things, while it did go sideways, uh, I know I wasn't alone in this, was pointing out that we were making uh, higher lows through it, which was setting the stage uh, for a foundation that could resume uh, what I have coined the mother of all bull markets in earnest, and it has. And you make a good point as we speak uh, after, you know, I think it was seven or eight straight up days. The ability for the market just to consolidate here and not sell off like it did several weeks ago is suggesting that this consolidation is going to be very short timed and would not be surprised either later today or certainly by the end of the week that we start a march up towards the $1,700 in gold and the 32 33 area on silver. So, it is very, very constructive as we speak. We always have in the back of our mind, we know the bear rates that take place from time to time. We know there's groups that try to take advantage of the downside. But even when they have now, when it was years ago, it would, they could knock it off for 6 to 12 months. Now they have some times where they can only knock it off for 6 to 12 hours. So uh, it's very, very constructive. I'm very, very enthusiastic here and, and just like the way the metals have traded uh, and, and how they're consolidating now. Yeah, same here. And let's talk about the mining sector because that is the Rodney Danger field of the stock market sector. And yet, if you're a hardcore value guy, if you're looking for stocks that are trading to substantial discounts to assets, return on investment, and all the traditional measures, 
can you find any place that's a better value play than the mining sector? Well, one of the things that is quite interesting, especially when we go up the food chain to emerging producers and producers, is when I began in the business back in the 80s, uh, it was very common for producers to carry market multiples twice or sometimes three, the average market multiple at that point would be about 45 or 50 times earnings. Now we're seeing a lot of the producers below uh, market uh, PEs, uh, whether it was unjustified to begin with, and that's what they come down to. The bottom line is, as you noted, as a sector, it's probably one of the more undervalued sectors in the market today. Uh, I, I do think we need to separate the major producers from the junior resource exploration. I think the majors are, are, are obviously are far more safer all the time, but in this particular case, uh, even so, because of the financing needs that the juniors have, and many of them are low on cash, and they've seen a fair amount of shares already outstanding, and we're going to get into a period now uh, as we approach year end where it becomes very difficult for them more than normal to finance. So I suspect that the, uh, the majors uh, will outperform the juniors, although I think both obviously have not only seen their worst days behind them, but both are going to work their way higher. But I think the junior market will see the bulk of any move after the first of the year. I think that's a pretty safe uh, bet because, like you say, the, the market just seems to be behaving completely different. It's kind of like uh, like – you're driving along in your car and something's not right, it's not running properly, then all of a sudden you realize that the emergency brake is engaged and you pull it out and all of a sudden the car starts to run right and it seems like the brake on this market also has been released and now it's, it's it seems like there's these little micro raids that take place throughout the day but they're about slowing down the advance and I think it's also a seasonal issue here because we're getting into the big gold buying season. And of course, we have China, you know, individuals. I talked to a gentleman there who lives in China. There are over 2 million Chinese who are participants in gold purchasing programs, automatic programs, money gets deducted from their account and used to purchase metals. So when you have that kind of demand picking up steam, there's really, I don't see much way that any any cartel can keep this thing down for long. Well, you're right. First, let uh, me respond to the cartel thing. That's why we've seen their ability shrunk to sometimes just a matter of hours versus the weeks, months, or years that they used to be able to influence the market. But you bring up two good points. First, the seasonality. And this is something I've spoken of quite a bit and speak again with you, and that is uh, really around Labor Day. It's not in stone, but it's usually around there there's a significant return of back to business of jewelry fabricators. In fact, they probably do about two-thirds of their business uh, between September and November, preparing not only for Christmas holidays, but then the, the, the various special New Year holidays overseas and then the Valentine's and so forth. But they, and we see a seasonal pickup in gold. We see seasonally trends where gold picks up. But the program you spoke of is something I've written about, and I haven't seen it written that much, so it would be a good time to talk about it, and that is I noted uh, in the last couple of years that the Chinese have begun what I termed an equivalent to our 401k program in the U.S., savings for their citizens, but instead of it going into financial assets, it went straight into the purchase of gold, hard assets. And like you said, there's a couple million now doing that, and you're going to see more and more, and they've made it just about as easy to do it as it is for an American worker to start a 401k program. So imagine, you know, uh, a this increasing uh, demand for gold and also from a holding standpoint versus a trading standpoint. So that is a, a big point that doesn't get discussed often, but you bring it up and it's worth to note that that is just another of the series bullish factors that have really changed the gold market. And that's where you still find uh, some of the old perma bears stuck. They're, they're viewing the gold market from 20 or 30 years ago when central banks were net sellers. They're not anymore when producers were big forward hedge sellers. They're not anymore. And they've never understood the dynamic or they've refused to, I think, especially for one particular person. To understand <laughs> who shall how, go unnamed? <laughs> yes, who, who, who never grasped 
what the ETFs did to the market. Now, I'm not here to debate whether owning a gold exchange traded fund is the same as owning gold or what have you. But what it did was, and, and remembering my days as a money manager, it allowed a way for big time investors to get involved in gold uh, in a big way. And uh, before that, it was encumbrance and difficult and expensive to buy physical bullion. Uh, the really only proxy at that point were mining shares, and that might be one of the reasons why mining shares don't get as much interest now because people use the gold ETFs as their proxy. But what it did was it brought in such a demand and a continuously increasing appetite for physical gold that it really helped kick, turn around uh, the uh, supply versus demand scenario in gold. And it's never been grasped or been refused to be grasped, and, and, and it continues to be. And, you know, the other thing I think that was worthy news, and, and I know you're on top of it, and, and I was I wasn't surprised that the media didn't cover it because I know how the media works in general. <laughs> what but, media? But, that, but, but the Soros news, I mean, here, yeah. if you go back at the depths of gold teetering near its support, I mean, there were so many stories planted, and the bears spoke about how Soros called gold the ultimate bubble, and you know it was going to cave, and it was their it was their firing line for why you got to get out of gold. And what happens? We learned that instead of being an actual seller, the guy was a net net major buyer. And uh, so you know sometimes it's, it's watch not what they say, but what they do. Yeah. And uh, that that was just another indication that the demand for gold remains constant and it's stripping out supply. Yep, you should you shall judge them by their deeds, right? Yes. <laughs> and that is so true, and that's why it's so important to look at the mainstream media about anything. But just we're talking about the metals now. But you have to take everything they say with a grain because they're agenda driven. They're serving other masters besides the public's, uh, the public's right to know and need to know. And if you followed the media, you would just get killed in stocks and, you know, you would have missed the entire precious metals bull market to date, which I personally believe uh, we haven't seen anything yet. Well, I concur with you in this regard, and that is that I believe our first leg is over, and if I have a moment, I, I like to expand on something, Carrie, that I've yeah, spoken sure. about, but maybe not often enough, and it takes a couple of minutes, but I think if people would grasp it, uh, they could potentially appreciate the steel upside potential that remains in metals. When I entered the brokerage business back in 1984, I'd already been investing in a few years, and we got to go back to that time to think about what the market was like at that point. The Dow Jones Industrial Average from the 1920s up until that period of time, the early 1980s, really only traded between 700 and 1,000. Hard to imagine, but go back and look. And, it, and that was its trading level. And in 1980, 81, things were so bad that there was an infamous uh, Business Week front page story that ran that said equities are dead. And, of course, the greatest equity bull market was born at that time. Well, there was an unknown newsletter at, writer at that time out of Gainesville, Georgia, named Robert Prechter. Of course. <laughs> and he predicted 3,700 on the Dow, and based on a method that really technical analysis wasn't anything like it is today involved in the markets, something called the Elliott Wave Theory. And people scoffed and laughed, and then when the Dow ran, and it ran up to 2,000 and changed, like 26, 2,700, Bob uh, became fairly popular, and then he issued a... Uh, a sell signal about the, the Dow in 1987, and I did in my new job as an investment strategist at the time, and we got a little, well, he got more fame out of it, but the market came down. And why I bring that up is the public did not get net long general equities till about 1995 or to about when the Dow was around 6,000. And, of course, we all know it ran to 14,000. And it seemed impossible to people when he made his prediction. And then, of course, even at 3,000, no one could have imagined 14,000. Now, I'm not saying the same percentage gain is coming for gold. But the same non-belief, the same kind of pattern has happened. We traded for a long time between two levels. We mostly traded between the 250 to, to 400 level, briefly at five, and for a very short time, 
uh, we got to 800 until the last few years when we broke above that. And despite breaking up and despite all that creasing, I still believe that if you went to 99% of all investors in North America, Canada, and the U.S., and were able to look at their financial uh, statements, you will see that they own no gold. And uh, I find it something like the, the general equity market when things changed. There were a lot of reasons that ended up enhancing the general equity market, and it, you know it had a tremendous ride. And now a lot of things changed the gold and silver market, and yet uh, the public isn't anywhere to be found. And so uh, I don't know if we'll see the same percentage gains, but it, it, it is acting like that. It, it, like you said earlier before we spoke, I wouldn't call so much a wall of worry, but a wall of non-interest. <laughs> and, it, it, and I mean, where could you look at something as gold and silver has done over the last 10 years and still find 99% of all investors have no exposure to it, in North America at least? Yeah, that is a great point and about the public only seeing opportunities once the the big money, the elites get in there and make the killing. And I would point to a, another person, a Bob Prechter-like prophet of the market, Meredith Whitney. She predicted the uh, real estate collapse. No one had ever heard of her. Boom, it happens. Then about two years ago, she predicted the Muni bond collapse, and nobody believed it. You're nuts. You're crazy. And now we're seeing it unravel. And it's funny how when the media sees people who represent the view that they like, they embrace them, and those people always have a platform. But when there are people out there like you, like the Meredith Whitney's, who are saying the things the media doesn't want you to hear, they just have a wall of indifference and no recognition for any divergent voices whatsoever. Yes, and that's the case. And and I always try to remind people, and but they seem to forget it, particularly in the markets getting hammered, and that is you're just never going to find widespread support for gold and silver. It's just not going to happen. It flies in the face. You know, it, we, we spoke, I told you that you're never going to walk in a Chevy dealer and he's going to tell you, look, if you really want a great car, go over to the Ford guy. <laughs> he's going to sell you what he has. And you're not going to find people who make a living selling stocks and bonds telling you to buy gold. It's just not ever going to happen. So you can't wait for the enthusiasm to be seen widespread because when it comes to gold and silver, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, agreed. And on that note, Peter, Granditch.com, they should sign up for your daily free newsletter. You had one in there that was really funny that I had clipped, but I can't remember it now over the weekend. It was hysterical. And uh, I'll find it. I'll put it up on the site. But thanks so much for being with us, and we'll talk to you again soon. Uh, I have a feeling 1700 we're hair, hair's breadth away from $1,700 gold. Thank you, Gary. All right. You be well. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.